have Dr. Rishamjit Kaur from CSIR, CSIO, Chandigarh. She is a part of Center of Excellence for Intelligent Sensors and Systems. This is in the institute, uh, CSIR institution called Central Scientific Instruments Organization. She has been keeping interest in a variety of topics which involve computation, data science, as well as application of machine learning in different areas. Of course, she will be talking to us today about olfaction, odor prediction, and how potentially we can use it in the context of perfumes, designing perfumes of certain styles with the help of data and machine learning. So I believe that this will be an enriching session going beyond what we have so far discussed and will be discussing henceforth. So without any much ado, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Rishamjit Kaur to deliver the talk. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I'm Rishamjit. Today I'll be talking about the work on flavor and fragrance, which we have been doing at CSR CSIO. The work is mostly led and driven by Dr. Ritesh Kumar, and I'll try to uh, explain not just the perfumery part, but also some of the sensor instrumentation part of it. So, um, okay, I hope everybody had a good lunch, right? So in the lunch, I'm sure that you have so, so much of food. Uh, when you, uh, the food, all of the different ingredients, maybe the different spices that you use, they have a different taste as well as the smell, right? And this weather is so lovely. There are so many uh, flowers outside. So when we look at it, we perceive that with the, with, the, with, the, with the vision, right? How beautiful the flower is, bright red or yellow, whatever. At the same time, the smell, that it's pleasant or unpleasant for whatever uh, surroundings which are there. So we perceive all this information using our senses. But the sense of smell or olfaction has a very uh, important place in the sense of neurological processing. Uh, because this is directly connected to parts of the brain which control our emotions as well as memories. Like the sense of smell, it takes us back to our childhood memories just by looking at maybe, you know, the fragrance of one city or the fragrance of a flower or a fragrance of your favorite spice. It can take you back to your uh, childhood, to the way your grandmother, Nani Dadi used to cook or, uh, or, or in the similar way. So uh, today, uh, like I'll talk about one important question like we are talking about fragrances so the important question is that why a particular molecule or why a particular anything ingredient or, or a substance smell in a particular way right like why the roses smell so sweet or so floral and why maybe the garbage has a particular kind of smell and this question has uh, sort of puzzled researchers for so many years, so many centuries. And if I break down this question into something very similar, uh, very simple, I'll say, into the different parts, I'll say that when we talk about smell, there are different volatiles, different chemicals which are all around us, right? Like uh, uh, the, the smell of a table, uh, like the, uh, the wooden smell or, or, or everything, even the different sort of perfumes that we use or the different lotions or the soaps that we use. So there are different molecules, they have different chemicals structure, their molecular weight, their number of rings, they have altogether different properties. Then these molecules, they we, we sniff them, they go into our, uh, like, uh, with, with the olfactory receptor neurons, and then they go through the whole processing by the brain, the olfactory bulb and whatnot. And after that, we give some sort of a descriptor to it. We call it the perceptual space. We say that, okay, this smells sweet, or this smells floral, or this smells fruity. So there is a certain, so now the question here is, how this particular chemical structure structures are related to our perception of smell. How do we say that something is a floral or sweet or what kind of properties are responsible for something like this? The, if I just go back into a bit of the history of olfaction, it is not something uh, like very recently that researchers have started doing it. The role of uh, pleasant smelling materials uh, it has been found in, you know, during the Harappan uh, civilization as well. The picture that you have in front of you, this is a terracotta distillation equipment which is at Takshila Museum, still available. And uh, it, it was being used so long ago for either for the distillation process or for, I, it is still a mystery if it, if it was used for maybe the alcohol or for the perfumery related substances. The, uh, the olfaction or the pleasant smelling material 
Aryans, they find its mention in Rig Vedas. Even the civilizations like Egyptians, they have been, uh, uh, they were like very good at making incenses. So they have been using it in their, again, in, uh, for their pleasure or for the different worship related ceremonies as well. Even in the, you know, the Greek philosopher in 50 BC also tried to uh, pose, uh, sort of gave his theory on why a particular molecule can have a smell. And he said that if a molecule is like a round, smooth, maybe it's a pleasant smelling. And if it is more sharp, uh, crooked, then it is maybe unpleasant. So, you know, about something like Kika, uh, Kiki and Buba effect, right? So, some that sort of a theory. And so it has been going around for a very long time. So now coming to the more modern perspective, if I talk about uh, like one is understanding how, why, why a particular molecule smell in a certain way. The next is, can we use that information? Can we use the science or the knowledge that we have generated to maybe create new fragrances itself? Like we see that the fragrances are all around us, right? From the very beginning of our day, we take shower, we, take, we use very fragrant soaps. It can actually elevate our mood, right? Or maybe uh, we select it on the basis of our certain set of personalities. So it's a very integral component of our daily life. But however, like the chemical space, it is big. There are like like 30 million uh, molecules just documented on PubChem, but the fragrant molecules are very few. There are hardly like few thousands of molecules which are documented. So it is of great use to us to not just look for the new, like not just to understand the ones which are already there, but also to look for the new uh, molecules itself, new fragrant molecules. And when we do that, we have to be very careful that it has to follow a certain strict regulation. It should be, we have to look into uh, factors like the skin sensitivity it should be because uh, people are going to use it so you cannot use something which is toxic you cannot use something which can cause allergies to the people so so you have to be careful in that aspect and when we talk about perfumery there are like two very uh, competing I'll say factors that play a role over there one is volatility another one is substantivity now we would like a molecule to be volatile because we want to smell it right if it is a lighter molecule it can easily evaporate and then we can smell it but at the same time we would like that smell to linger on for a longer time period to stay for a longer time so it means that it should not just go away like then what's the point of applying the perfume if it is just going to you know uh, this you cannot just keep on applying perfume every five hours okay I want to smell good every five hours we have some sort of automated so we want it to stay so these are the two competing aspects so in order to achieve that what is generally done is uh, we actually mix different molecules, we mix different fragrances. So the very basic thing that we do is in the terms of aromatic notes, we have like primary, middle, base. So first we have uh, like the primary, these are those molecules which you immediately notice as soon as you apply the perfume. So this is the first noticeable impression that you get. That's your primary note. Then there is a middle note which will last for a little longer. And then there is a base note which will last for let's say hours for maybe five to six hours or more than that, this is uh, something that will uh, linger on and it appears much later than the first two nodes. And uh, it is also important when we do this sort of mixing or blend blending to understand that what kind of fragrance or what kind of molecule will go with the another one. Does sandal with, uh, sandalwood go with patchouli or does lavender go with mint? Because it's not necessary that, uh, that mixing two pleasant smelling uh, molecules will create another pleasant smelling. It could be something altogether unpleasant. You may just simply hate that fragrance, right? Maybe try mixing two of your favorite perfumes and then you will get to see that it's not something that you want to do. Similarly, like even there are some molecules which may be very pleasant at the lower concentration concentration but the same molecule when it is at a higher concentration it will be like a putrid smelling molecule you may might want to run away from it then the next question is in which proportion it should be mixed should it be like one is to one is to one like the equal proportion or should it be uh, one should be at the higher other should be at the lower concentration right and then there is a human aspect to it in the sense that who is wearing it male female are, the, are those fragrances like unisex fragrances 
and it is not just in a strict gender sense of a way it also depends on our like what is what time of the day it is one right maybe in the morning you want to wear a different kind of fragrance whereas for night for parties you want to wear something else like generally uh, maybe many people prefer lemony or citrusy in the morning but during the night they will maybe uh, uh, male they mostly uh, they will, may like to go for musk or uh, some those sort of smells and then it is it also depends on your mood like what what kind of uh, mood a user has then uh, what is the identity of the final mixture let's say i mix two different fragrances one of floral one of fruity one of maybe musky when we create a final mixture what will be what will it smell like will it be floral or herbaceous or maybe something else right now the question here is like can we do all of this with computer from the centuries from generations we have been this is more of an art where some experienced people and you know it's it's a well it's a very well uh, paid job if if someone has an expertise in this then i, I believe you are uh, set for, <laughs> for 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 a long time and uh, it uh, there are proper courses for it and they teach you how to be a uh, professional in in this sort of field but now the question that we are trying to ask here is can we do all this with computer can computers be creative enough to uh, to create new fragrances to understand the basic principles behind it now this is where the computational creativity element comes into picture right where we we where we would like to create something which is not just novel but also of value to a certain segment like we can be creative in any aspect we can be creative and create maybe a car with 15 steering wheels but that is of no use to anybody right so such kind of so unless and until there is a value that you are adding to it uh, there may not be uh, much of a point so we would like to create fragrances maybe which has some industrial application or some other usage some maybe defense or the societal purposes as well and these days we take we like we leverage the big data which is available there the algorithms which are out there to to create new fragrances and to create uh uh okay yeah to, to to create new fragrances now but doing so it is also not that simple there are many challenges that comes into picture now the very first challenge is in itself is the inability of humans to describe the smell for example if i uh, just ask about you know uh, i i don't know maybe how a coffee smells Uh, maybe many of you will give a different kind of description to it and uh, it all it is also very cultural specific context as well for example uh, if i ask about fish uh, i don't know if bengalis they may say oh yummy delicious <laughs> but uh, many people they may they may not like the smell of they may not like smell of fish so there is a cultural context over there so the way we describe the smell that in itself is noisy so our output based on which we want to predict based on which we want to develop the algorithms that output in itself is noisy at least the english language in itself is not sufficient in fact there are uh certain you know communities uh still uh, let's say a bit of a bit towards a, a hunter gatherer sort of communities they have very specific word for like smell related words for blood let's say or even their you know the hunting sort of activities so 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 like this whole the perceptual space in itself it creates quite a lot of big problem then the next challenge is uh that there is no like it is not continuous in the sense that let's say with the vision with colors we know like if i mix red and green i'll get yellow if i mix red and blue i'll get this magenta sort of a color if i mix green and blue i'll get cyan right so there are certain aspects of it where we know about colors we uh, like we know about vision we uh, know uh, know about uh, uh, how the sound signals behave but if i talk about smell Uh, we don't know like let's say if i take this molecule let's say if i take methane and replace hydrogen with an oh then what kind of smell will there be so in that sense there is no continuity uh, over there and in fact uh, the molecules which may have very similar structure they may smell altogether different so that in itself pose a very big challenge 
Then the third part is that the size and the dimensionality of this space in itself is unknown. As I earlier mentioned that we have around 31 million uh, molecules from PubChem, whereas the fragrant molecules are very few, there may be many other out there and we just we are just not aware of it. The space is uh, still, I'll say, yet to be uh, explored over there. Then this is where uh, uh, the role of AI comes into. This is where we use machine learning to understand the olfaction first and then also to create new fragrances. So in order to do this, what we have done, uh, we uh, created first like a curated bunch of data sets which are out there. Uh, we use data sets from perfumery, agriculture, various odor experiments from various research papers, created a huge databases. Then this has information about their chemical structures. We did some sort of pre-processing and uh, uh, certain, I won't go into the details of it, but I'll just say that, you know, the first step is the database collection where we get databases for the, uh, using the chemical structures. And then at, this, at the same time, from the human sensory panels, uh, we get their sensory scores itself that whether certain molecule is like what kind of percept it has. And then using, a whole lot of machine learning pipeline. We try to uh, predict uh, what kind of smell will there be. So some of the results which uh, I'll show you here, like, yeah, so in this challenge, what we were able to achieve was that let's say if you have a certain desired sensory profile that this is what you want with the certain mixture or, or in this case, it was a monomolecule that, you know, it should be woody, it should be uh, pleasant. So a certain sensory profile and what we could do was we could uh, like find out the molecular structures. We could predict what kind of molecules will be there, which will have a similar sensory profile that we want. So this ability to sort of reverse engineer smell by designing new molecule, it was uh, a sort of uh, novel in a way. And uh, it was also for the very first time, we were able to predict the uh, odor from the molecular structures with great accuracy. Like we could also tell that if this is the molecule and if you want to replace it with something similar smelling, then what are the other sort of molecules which are over there? So uh, apart from this, as I was saying that we also try to understand, are there like certain basic dimensions? Like with the color, we can say there is RGB. Are there certain basic uh, dimensions to the olfaction as well? We found Found, uh, there could be more as well. We found that there were some seven important communities which were out there when people start describing the smell. Some of them are very dominant. Some of the descriptors are used more often as compared to the other. For example, the fruity, green, sweet, uh, woody. These were more dominant sort of descriptors which are generally used by people. So if we just talk about it many times, like we found one community which is for, uh, for fruity. Now, uh, if we uh, like we observed that even fruits like let's say apple, pineapple, banana, even though they have very different smells, right? The pineapple may smell very differently from the from banana, but they are still grouped together because when people uh, talk about smells, many times they associate it with the objects because that's how we describe it. We don't know what could be the better words to describe that smell. Similarly for let's say floral. So we put rose and let's say jasmine into the same category. It is also, I'll say, because of the way uh, we, uh, we, we learn how to describe certain objects that we have started grouping these smells as well. So generally when people describe smell, they use more common words and it is only when, you know, when they are further pressed upon, they will go into more details of it. They'll maybe first say that, okay, this is floral and if you will further ask, they'll say, okay, maybe it smells like a rose. Now this kind of uh, description in itself, there is a hierarchical representation in the sense that we have first stage, let's say floral, and then we say it is it is rose, and then we further maybe describe it using some other. This sort of representation, uh, this sort of understanding of the odor perceptual space, it helped us in developing a recommendation engine, which we actually used with one of the like foreign client. We developed it for them for where for certain 
uh, edible products, actually these were oils, uh, they had the sensory scores, uh, sensory scores for all of those, uh, all of those products. And based on that hierarchical representation, we developed a recommendation engine which was on non-Euclidean spaces. I will not go into the details of it, but it performed so well that uh, then any of the traditional methods or any of the methods that that company was using, and as a result, they gave us, sorry, not us, but our organization, a lot of money. Is it still not audible? Okay, okay, okay. So, um, yeah. So uh, yeah, so now when we're talking about fragrances, I just cannot like skip talking about Kannauj, right? The perfume city of India. Kannauj, which is known for manufacturing ethers and essential oils and supplying it all over the world. So if have any one of you visited Kannauj before? No, right? Okay, it's a, uh, oh, interesting. Like, are you from Kannauj or just when there? Are you from Kannauj? Very interesting. It's a very interesting city. If you, it's a very small town, I'll say, but almost everybody, uh, like many people in Kannauj, are somewhere involved in the process of making of essential oil. Somebody is growing flowers. Someone is picking flowers. Someone is involved in itself the process of you know the 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 essential oil uh, making, distillation, and all whatnot. So it's so it's very interesting, and I think the whole uh, sort of town it's it smells very sweet. It's a very <laughs> fragrant sort of a place. Now, the, te the technology that they use for, uh, for, for manufacturing of ether, they call it Deg Bhabka. Now, it's a, like these, they have these huge copper pots, uh, copper bronze sort of pots, which are there. And they have this for, like, for generations. They pass it down from one generation to another. And the way they uh, produce essential oils, it, it's very traditional in the sense that it's again more of an art. Like there will be someone who will be, you know, uh, they'll, they'll like sort of place the wood, they, they burn it, put the material manually, and then th there is like this water where the whole after distillation, it sort of collects over there. Uh, and, you know, somebody will be touching the water to check the temperature and say, okay, okay, it's fine. Now this is the right sort of temperature. So even the small interventions like the automation or the putting some sort of pressure sensors, temperature sensors to understand what the process is, is of great value to them. And this is what we did for them. We installed our uh, data acquisition systems with whole lot of sensors and we tried to understand their process and in order to, like, and can we improve their yield as well? well, using uh, the whole data which we capture from the sensors and then further doing the modeling and, and all. So this was one of the very interesting projects that we got to work on. And when we talk about smells, like one is yes, the humans, they sense it, they smell it and then they tell you pleasant, unpleasant. But can there be like a more, uh, uh, like a method where we can use instruments to measure smell or at least instruments to uh, in some way quantify it. So there comes the electronic noses into, into picture. So at CSIO, we have developed our own prototypes as well as we use some standard equipments to uh, sort of measure the volatiles which are over there. And in the process, like what generally happens in electronic nose, like there's sensor array, and as soon as the molecules are absorbed over there, absorbed or absorbed, then uh, there is some change in electrical signal. And using those changes in electrical signal, we try to quantify or we try to sort of measure the uh, differences uh, in, in, in the volatiles. So this was actually one of the very first project on which we worked, that was of T. It was done in collaboration with CSIR IHPT. They work on uh, teas quite a lot. So generally, we all drink tea, right? So we know that in market, the tea which is available, there will be leafy tea, greeny tea, and they have very different uh, costs as well associated with it. So generally what happens is there are tea tasters. They taste the tea, their job is this. Like whole day they will be tasting, I don't know how many different type of tea, and then they will tell, okay, this is the astringency, this is bitterness, this is the sweetness. They have certain set of parameters. And then based on those, uh, uh, those sensory evaluations, the cost of tea is decided. So the question here was that can we somehow 
try to quantify this this sort of quality using the uh, sensor sensor arrays in itself so we took different t samples and then captured the data developed ai algorithms on top of it and we try to look at can we look uh, like try to classify the different varieties of t so we could like see that yes after doing whole lot of processing i'm not going into the details but if anyone is interested i am happy to talk about it later that we were able to tell the differences between different type of teas they were manufactured using different processes at different steps of fermentation and 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 all so um, yeah similarly the another project that we did it was on the cashew nut quality now india is one of the largest uh, processors of cashew nut we don't uh, we don't produce it but we process it and we are one of the largest in the world now but when we export that cashews one of the problems that we face is that the cashews they look very good they look like you know white and all very but uh, they get rancid and the whole lots they get rejected and then they come back to us so this problem was again posed to us by an industry who were actually the one of the biggest processors in india and they and with them we sort of try to figure out what were the different type of volatiles what are the different uh, which makes a certain cashew rancid so we looked at the different let's say the bad cashews some of the mixed quality which you know can be used in the locally as well and some very good quality and we try to figure out what are the different volatiles which are responsible uh, for giving cashew such kind of uh, uh, smell and then yeah we we could figure out some of the important and then in the next phase it was that uh, we will be working on uh, developing maybe a sensor array for for that but uh, yes so uh, this is our team and uh, most of the work that i have shared it has been done by dr ritesh dr amol dr saurav like uh, uh, it, it's a it's a team where all of us we are working on smells and taste as well i did not uh, talk about taste but certain number of projects which we are working are like uh, you know we have salt but for tata we are working that uh, how salty is your salt that you know different type of salts are available in the market so can you tell that generally what happens is we say okay low sodium salt so but we are used to certain uh, certain saltiness level so we buy that expensive low sodium salt but then we end up putting the <laughs> large large amount of it so it doesn't make any sense it's not doing us any uh, help so we are working with them uh, that's one of the project where we are looking into how we can uh, again quantify the saltiness and another again as i said bread and butter of our lab tea like how to mask the bitterness of tea like from the taste aspects uh, and this is where i'll end my presentation thank you very much mm -hmm.